Abba's event speakers program. Before I introduce today's guest, let me mention some of our upcoming events. At noon tomorrow, Campus Events welcomes comedian George Carlin. And at 7 p.m. tomorrow, Campus Events presents actor Richard Dreyfus. Both will be speaking right here in the ballroom. And tomorrow evening, to cap off this uh, long day, come to a concert featuring Peter Case and Flophouse in the Cooperage, beginning at 8.30 p.m. And this Thursday and Friday, Campus Events Film Program presents Torch Song Trilogy and Working Girl. And Sunday night at 7.30, the baseball film, Eight Men Out. Our guest today is internationally acclaimed for her performances on stage, screen, and television, first receiving widespread notice for her role as solitaire in the James Bond classic, Live and Let Die. She has since starred in such productions as The Scarlet Pimpernel, East of Eden, The Sun Also Rises, and Somewhere in Time. In addition, she originated the stage role of Constanze Weber, Mozart's wife, in the highly praised play Amadeus. And, in 1988, she was honored with an Emmy Award for her portrayal of Maria Callas opposite Raul Julia in the television production of The Richest Man Alive. Equally prolific at adopting English and American accents to suit the character she plays, this British-born actress will set new performance standards for her upcoming role in theatrical feature The French Revolution, Starring as Marie Antoinette in the cinematic tour de force, she performs the role in both French and English language versions of the film, which were shot simultaneously on location in France. Her upcoming theatrical releases also include The Tunnel with Peter Weller and The Keys to Freedom, starring Omar Sharif. Currently, Ms. Seymour stars as Natalie Jastrow in an ABC's extraordinary miniseries, Worn Remembrance. Her performance in this epic production, which was filmed in 10 different countries, has earned her both public and critical accolades. Part two of this series will be airing beginning this Sunday. Let's take just another look at some of Ms. Seymour's work. Roll the clips, please. Who is it? Richard Collier. Sleep all right? Wonderfully. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't sleep too well either. Uh, but I was on a porch chair, so, you know. Don't you even have a room? Uh, yes, I will, at 918. Room 416. I mean, would, would you like to go to breakfast? At 6 a.m. Oh, well, later? I don't eat breakfast on performance days. Oh, no, of course not. Um, lunch? Mr. Collier. No, 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 it's not Mr. Collier. Isn't that your name? Well, yes, that's my name, but I've never... What? Marie. She's sleeping in the other room. Marie? My maid. Ooh, I'm sorry. What? Of course, my name is Mr. Collier, but I was hoping maybe you'd call me by my first name, Richard. Why should I? I don't know. Just hoped you would. When can I see you today? I should be rehearsing all day. All day? That's crazy. Shut you can't... Wake up. Hmm. Will you walk with me? Can you do that much? I can't. <sighs> Young woman, if you do not walk with me, I shall go mad. Positively insane. I do crazy things to myself. <sighs> walk with me. Please. Say, Richard... That's me. Thank you. I would love to walk with you and talk with you and get to know you and not be afraid of you and resolve everything. Say yes. Yes. One o'clock. Mm -hmm. Outside the hotel. She's crazy about me. Please join me in giving a very warm UCLA welcome to Jane Seymour.
Hi. <laughs> it works. <laughs> This is really exciting for me. I, I never thought I'd get this lucky to come and talk to all of you and, and hear all your views and your questions. And I, I can't wait to, to start with the question bit. But uh, since I know you're probably going to start out by asking me what it's like to kiss Christopher Reeve, Tom Selleck, Roger Moore, I thought, <laughs> I thought I'd... <clears throat> I've lost my voice, too. I thought I'd start this off on a, on a slightly serious note by just explaining to you why I flew back from Paris to come and, and see you all. Um, I'm in the middle of filming the French Revolution and I've got the War and Remembrance coming out at the end of the week and it's a wonderful show, that probably the show I'm most proud of of everything I've ever done. And I, we were a little bit disappointed because we didn't have as big an audience in the first half of it as we'd hoped. And when they looked into who actually was watching it, the demographics, they found out that it was the older generation. It was the generation that were there during the war. And that none of your generation, or very few of your generation, and very few of my generation, actually sat down and watched it. And um, that seemed to me to be very sad, because really, this is subject matter that's vitally important for all of us. This is not ancient history. Um, they are some young people, if they knew anything about Hitler, and uh, for example, they all think he's German when they know that he was actually Austrian. And some people thought the Holocaust is something that happened in the Middle Ages. You know, they're that ignorant. I know you aren't that ignorant, but it isn't ancient history. It's something that is still going on today. Jews are persecuted, blacks are persecuted, all minorities are persecuted all over the world. And what's important about this miniseries is it shows the human the emotional element of, I mean, of what it's like to confront this, what it's like to fight a war that has this as its major principle. And I think it's very important for all of us. Um, it's happening today, it's happening again. It's not ancient history. It's a vitally important story to be told. And it's important to take it out of the history books and show it as it concerns American people in an American family. And so, um, anyway, I'm here, and please, fire away with your questions. Um, I believe there are microphones on either side. No questions? <laughs> oh, someone's been brave. Hello, um, my name is Melanie. It's really a pleasure for me to get to ask you a question, since you are my, I admire your work most of any actress out today. Um, I'd like to know what, what approach you use in... Uh, when you receive a part, what approach do you use? Well, it depends on the part that I have, but recently I've been very fortunate to uh, be given roles of people who actually existed, like Maria Callas, Wallace Simpson, Marie Antoinette, um, and then of course War and Remembrance, which was a, not a real-life story, but it's many, many millions of people's real-life stories. So I do an enormous amount of research. I read everything I can lay my hands on, um, in the case of War and Remembrance, I interviewed and spoke with lots of survivors, and I talked to them, especially female survivors, about what it was like for them and, and how they survived and what their experience was like. Um, you know, in terms of Wallace and Maria Callas, I watched documentary footage. Uh, for Maria Callas, I learned about well, two or three arias, and I studied with the professor of music at um, another university in Santa Barbara, because I live up there. <laughs> um, what else have I done? I, I really, I, I study as much as I can around the subject, and that's one of the things that I find most gratifying about my job, because I, I really have a chance to learn a great deal more than I would you know, if I was just reading the odd book on the subject. Thank you. Uh, you've uh, you've worked in I'm over here. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> you've worked in all the uh, the sort of aspects of the entertainment medium, the uh, with television and movie and theater. Is there one that you favor more than the other? Like, do you prefer to be on stage, or do you are you equally adept at all of them? Shall we say? I'll tell you. It's a question I'm often asked. I love the theater because in the theater you get what I'm getting now, which I feel the energy of the people who are listening, and I feed off of it, and I give it back. And, and you ask any actor, I think most actors love theater because you have a response. When you do the film and television that I do, you do it and then years later, it seems, it comes out 
and then there's commercials in the middle of it or um, they give it a lousy release or it ends up in the video store and no one ever talks to you about it. You have no idea whether anyone liked it or not. You just know what the critics thought, which is not necessarily what the public feel. So um, I think theatre is my favourite, but, uh, but I love uh, film and television because it reaches a much wider audience. I think there are topics that I am interested in making that that deserve television because many more millions of people will see it. And I think there's something wonderful about doing film for the big screen because it's there forever and uh, it's nice to look back on. Thank you. Um, my question's a little out of the ordinary, but I've always wanted to ask you this. In the movie Head Office, when your character was promoted to executive vice president of public relations, she had two gigantic phallic symbols placed in her office. Yep. And is that due to the fact that she was sleeping away to the top of that company? Oh, yes. Well, I think... <laughs> absolutely. In fact, if you, if, since you're, you, you've seen this movie, and I'm thrilled to know that you did because it's one of my personal favorites, um, the woman in, in that company was the only honest member of the company. She very honestly was sleeping her way to the top. It was all the men that were surreptitiously knifing one another in the back, you know, pretending to be uh, fellow workers. Um, I really enjoyed that part, and, and uh, I'm glad you noticed that. <laughs> Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Hi. Hi. You sort of preempted my question in your introduction, but... Um, I was wondering, uh, since you're here on a day, it's called Yom HaShoah, which is the day that Jewish people remember the victims of the Holocaust. I was wondering if, you know, it was just coincidence or planned, and I guess by your introductory speech, there was, that was part of the reason. No, actually, I only found out that it was that particular day today, about ah. five minutes ago. So... I consider it fate. Um, I was invited to come here, and in fact, I'm, I'm only able to do, I'm only in town for two days, so uh, it just happened to be that day. But I'm very, very pleased that it happens to be the day that we do remember the victims. I think it's very appropriate, and, um, you know, I, I don't think we could have chosen a better day, really. And I just wanted to know how your part in War and Remembrance might have affected. I may be wrong, but in an article I read that you are Jewish and might have affected your sensibilities and how you felt about that. Um, first of all, I'm not Jewish as far as the Jewish people are concerned because my mother isn't Jewish. My father's family is Jewish, although he's an atheist, so I was not brought up with any religion at all. Um, through playing Natalie, I discovered, as Natalie discovers, my heritage rather more than a religion, and a heritage which I'm very proud to be a part of. And I, it became very clear to me that I, who am really not a Jew, would have been one of the first in the gas chambers if I'd been there. And so indeed would my children, and I'm married to um, a, a, an American Protestant, they too would have been put into the gas chambers. Um, this is, this is the, the reason that I, I feel that the whole Holocaust, the whole, the atrocities were so horrendous. I mean, it wasn't people who believed in something that, that, that put them in, uh, in the gas chambers. It was the fact that they had bloodlines to, to a, a so-called race. Um, I now feel, I, I'm not a Jew, but I feel very proud to have that blood in me and, and very happy to, to speak about it and to learn about it. And I've met many extraordinary people who survived the Holocaust, one of whom, in fact, worked with us on the film. What's unique in the second part of War and Remembrance is that all the Holocaust scenes are very accurate. And I've spoken to everyone that I've ever met who was ever in Auschwitz, and they said it was scarily accurate. It's the first time that ever in the history of film or television that it's been depicted as it was. It's not been sensationalized, it's not been romanticized, it's not been sanitized. I'm there naked, I'm there with five, six hundred thousands, you know, I can't remember how many people there were, thousands, I think. And, and we all went through, try to recreate it as honestly as possible. And the man who worked under Dan Curtis as the first assistant director, Branko Lustig from Yugoslavia, um, also staged the extras in Holocaust and I believe in Sophie's Choice. 
And um, he was in Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen himself. He was a survivor. And he was given carte blanche by Dan Curtis to stage these sequences. And that's why it was accurate. And um, they even went so far as to... They had to find people who were Jewish or Jewish-looking to surround me in, in the scenes when we were in the train and, and the whole process. And they couldn't find any Jews in Poland or in Yugoslavia. Hitler had done that good a job, or that terrible a, a job, as one, obviously. So they went to Vienna, and they asked in some synagogues if there were some people, some Jewish people, who would like to help us make the film. And I had the privilege of working with at least four or five people who had actually survived the camps. So on a daily basis, I was surrounded by reality, or as close to it as one could have. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, yes? um, being such an extremely beautiful woman, <laughs> which I think everybody <laughs> thank agreed. You, thank you. Yeah, um, I just wondering, do you have a problem either people taking yourself seriously, or did you have a problem in the industry as far as substantiating yourself as a prominent actress? Well, uh, yeah, I, I used to have a problem because uh, I did a thing called a James Bond film, which I never read the books and never seen one of those films before. And, Roger Moore nicknamed me Baby Bernhardt because I thought it was a serious acting role. <laughs> but I was 20, you know, what did I know? Um, and after that, I, although I'd started out you know, playing the classics in England and doing very serious drama, I suddenly had to fight that image. And uh, I think uh, since I did War and Remembrance, or since I did the screen test for it, because I had to test for it three years ago, um, word got out that I was capable of playing vulnerable women, women that got ugly, <laughs> women that suffered. And since then, I'm now being asked to play all kinds of character roles. And um, really, uh, of all the actresses that I know, in, certainly in television, anyway, I'm given the character roles rather than the leading lady roles. And, uh, and I'm, I'm very happy to be doing that. I feel that I've achieved something by doing that, because I, I would rather play those roles. Thank you. Hi, my name Hi. is Shelley. Um, there was a reader's poll published that said that you're the favorite to play Scarlett O'Hara in, <laughs> in a remake of Gone with the Wind if it happens, which is my personal choice also, but would you take it if the role was offered to you, and if not, who do you think could possibly play it better? <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously no one could play it better. <laughs> um, whether or not I would ever play it... Um, would depend, as far as I'm concerned, entirely upon the script. I don't see any reason whatsoever in doing a remake, and that's not what I, I read. I read the same newspapers you read, and I read all kinds of things, lies about myself. It's amazing the things I'm supposed to get up to. Um, but I'm a, I'm a great fan of Gone with the Wind. It was my favorite book, my favorite movie. I'm an enormous fan of Vivian Lee's. Um, I have actually, was actually asked a number of years ago to play the life story of Vivian Lee, which is something I would be fascinated to do. Um, the, whether or not I would ever do a sequel to, to Gone with the Wind, to answer your question, would depend on whether they asked me <laughs> and uh, whether it, it was really well written and I felt that it was going to hold up to the original. But I think it's a, it's a, hell, of a, a hell of an act to follow and I'm not sure that uh, anyone in their right mind would want to take that one on. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to thank you for taking time off to come out here and talk to us. Oh, you're welcome. And um, when you first started acting, did, how did that happen? Did you just wake up one morning and say, I want to act? Did you always know you were going to act? Or did you act, take acting classes because you were shy like some actresses do? Or how did it all begin? I was a ballet dancer. And since I could walk, my mother said I was knocking things over in the kitchen. So it was safer to send me to ballet school. And I was a classical dancer. I ended up dancing with the London Festival Ballet. I danced with the Russian, the Kirov Ballet at Covent Garden. And that was my whole life till I was 17. But the college I went to, they insisted that if you were going to be a ballerina, you had to also do modern and choreography and drama and singing and uh, oh, everything, you know, a very wide um, education. And when I was 17 years old, I had an accident and hurt my knees and I couldn't dance anymore. So I was um, put into the drama uh, side of the school, and um, fortunately, the, I um, was hired as a dancer in a chorus in a film called Oh to Lovely War, 
And um, I was the sort of dancing I could still do with my bad knees. I just couldn't do um, point work. I couldn't do ba uh, classical ballet anymore. And uh, I sang and danced in that. I was like a hoofer. And I had one line, and I was spotted. And that's what happened. Uh, an agent spotted me and said that he... Th he said, quote, unquote, I'm going to make you into a star. And I said, well, it's very nice, but I have to finish my college first. And he said, well, if you change your mind, I'm available. And it was like a dream come true. I mean, it never happens in the real world, but that's what happened. I, I then started acting and, um, and kept meaning to go to acting school, but I never got round to going to acting school. It doesn't and uh, I worked on uh, Amadeus about seven years ago with Sir Peter Hall, who was the head then of the National Theatre of Great Britain, who offered me a place at the National Theatre after I finished doing the play. And I said, do you think I should go to acting school while I'm here in New York, you know, to the method school? And he said, don't do it. Don't go anywhere near it. And I said, why? And he said, because you're the most dangerous actress I've ever met. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, well, you take chances without knowing. And you are very real. And he said, I'm not sure whether the method system or any training would spoil that. So I think what you should do is just keep plugging away and if they'll hire you, uh, try it. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello. I just wanted to say I'm thrilled that you came to UCLA because you've been my favorite actress for years and it's just a great opportunity to be able to speak to you. Thank you. Um, but I wanted to know what is your favorite role that you've ever played? Oh, that's such a tough one, because it's always the one I'm involved in. Um, I mean, at the moment, I just love playing Marie Antoinette, but I, I think Natalie would be right up there. And I think uh, Somewhere in Time was probably the most pleasant experience I ever had on a film. And I think East of Eden, which was a long, long time ago, was... Um, an extraordinary role. So I think somewhere between the three of them, four of them. <laughs> then there's a few other. I, it's very hard, you know. I, I'm, I'm very self-critical. I never like anything I do. I, I like bits of it sometimes. And, uh, but I would say that Natalie, uh, Natalie is right up there in Warren Remembrance. Is there anyone that inspires you? Any actress or...? Any actress? Um, yes, Anne Bancroft. She inspired me. I, I think she's extraordinary. I also um, always found v uh, Vanessa Redgrave extraordinary. Um, Vivian Lee, because I felt Vivian Lee took, she was beautiful, she was elegant, she was dangerous. <laughs> she was uh, a character actress and, you know, the ultimate leading lady. So um, a lot of people have inspired me. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Hi. Uh, have you been a if you've been in Paris, you probably didn't see the entertainment <clears throat> uh, tonight uh, report about the controversy. Have you heard about that? Yes, I have. Yes. Um, if you want to comment on it. Uh, sure. What, do you want to ask a question or do you want me just to make a comment on it? I don't know if anyone saw it, but um, <clears throat> basically um, somebody who, I, I, mean, I don't know who it is, but somebody who claimed to be on the crew of our film three years ago in Yugoslavia, uh, sold a story to the Star magazine, which we all know is a very intellectual <laughs> magazine and always gets its facts straight. And um, basically, uh, very serious allegations were made against Dan Curtis, the producer director of um, Warren Remembrance, and myself for standing by. They claimed that a uh, three year old orphan had been um, abused. Um, and mistreated on the set and that we had basically put him through horrors, uh, unmentionable horrors to and terrorized him to make him um, play this, this very, very horrifying scene. The, the truth of the matter is that I was there. I'm a mother of three, two of my own and one stepchild. I uh, am my, my main charity in life that I work for is Child Help USA. I mean, I, child abuse is very much something that, that matters to me and always has been since I was a tiny tot in England. And I would never, ever allow anything like that to happen in front of me. They claim the child was drugged, which I do not believe to be true. I was there. They claim the child worked 13 hours, which isn't true. And um, the truth of the matter is that the kid was five years old. We, I, I have a, ch a child in the film, and the child is a baby, then a bigger baby, then a toddler. So there were ten, at least 10 children who played the one child. And um, so as not to displace children, we would 
and taking you know, nine months of filming all over Europe, we would hire a, a local child in Yugoslavia when we were in Yugoslavia, a local child in Italy when we were in Italy. And this little boy uh, was five years old. Um, he didn't cry at all in the morning. We were doing um, scenes walking to this, this cell where, where this horrible torture happens. Natalie is tortured by the Gestapo in the scene. And in the scene, the boy, the, they threaten Natalie. She has to, to do some terrible sexual thing to this uh, Nazi officer and otherwise it will tear the boy apart in two and they're holding him upside down by his feet. And I am required to be incredibly emotionally upset, in fact hysterical. Well, what happened was when we started shooting it, the little boy had been practicing for two weeks with the stuntmen to do the upside down bit and he loved it. He thought that was fun. And we, we thought we might have a problem because he obviously is not supposed to, to laugh or smile during those moments. Um, but of course the bit that came before it was where I was being screamed at by the Nazi officer, by Robert Stevens, and I had to cry hysterically and scream, don't do it, don't do it. And the boy became very, very upset by my crying. And all of us were just, it, it just got to the heartstrings and we said, my goodness, that's a terrible cry, this poor child, you know, doesn't he understand this is just acting? So I went to the lady who was um, looking after him, the lady who, were, who looked after him in the home, the foster home where he lived. Uh, he has parents, he was in a foster home and he's since been adopted. Um, and she said, I spoke with him and he said that he was upset by my crying and uh, not by the upside down bit at all. So. I said to the, the lady looking after him, well, what can I do? I can't not cry. I have to. That's my job. I, I'm here to cry, and, and that's what I have to do. <laughs> and so I said, can you explain to him in Serbo-Croatian, in, in Yugoslav, in his language, while well, I sit here, and I'll, I'll wipe away the tears and smile and show him that it's acting, you know, that, that when they say action, I pretend and I, I, I have to cry, and that he shouldn't be afraid because I'm not really afraid, and these people aren't really bad people. They're, they're also pretending it's a game. Well, obviously, the kid never understood the game. And when you normally um, do these shows with children, and there are always small children, it seems, when I'm acting, um, there's a mother there who explains to them. And I can explain to them and talk to them about it because I can speak their language. This little boy, of course, I couldn't communicate with, which was so frustrating. And the little boy was so upset at seeing me with these puffy eyes and these tears and, and all this emotion that for me to go up and cuddle him between takes you know, didn't work. I had to allow this child to have his comfort from the, the lady that looked after him. And basically, I would never ever have allowed any of the things that we were accused of doing or having happen there to happen, knowingly. Um, the child was never upside down for, as they said, 15 minutes. He was upside down maximum of 40 seconds. He wasn't drugged or sent away to a doctor. He went away at lunchtime to his friends at the foster home and he had lunch and apparently never had a nap. And I have a three-year-old that uh, sounds like uh, we're torturing him when I ask him to put his clothes on to go to school in the morning, you know. And, and I think a lot of people who don't have children don't know that children sometimes can make an unbelievable scream. You know, it's, it's very terrifying if you've never heard a child scream. So, I mean, I, I'll answer any more questions you have on the subject. The only thing, um, so they just showed a letter that was signed by a lot of the cast and crew. So were they, um, did they not quite understand the situation? I'll tell you what happened. We had a very small room because it wasn't a film set where you can move walls. It was a real cell. And we only had room for about 15 people to be in there. And as you know, a film crew is like hundreds of people. And in fact, most of the people who signed that letter were never in the room. They were outside, so probably all they heard was the scream. Right. And probably one or two people who were inside there said, can you believe this? You know, they're letting this child scream. And they did this letter. What I think is venal is that the people who have put this together waited three years oh, yeah. to try and destroy subject matter that is rare to have on television. This is not easy, easy light watching fluff. This is not going to make big bucks for anyone, this movie. This is a movie that is out there to educate masses of people into the horrors that happened only 50 years ago that are happening again today and will happen again tomorrow unless we all take it upon ourselves to, to stop that kind of supremacy. Um, that's why I think it's very, very important. And I think that the, the, the person who's come out and waited three years to come out with this story 
This person never talked to me on the set at the time and said, how can you let this happen? Not one of those people who signed that letter came on the, you know, who were supposedly were on the set, came up to me or to Dan Curtis and said, this is terrible, you mustn't allow this to continue. And not one of those people came to me and said, we're writing a letter to complain about the filming of, last, of yesterday, how do you feel about it, do you want to, to write this letter? Not one of them. It was done as a, a plot. It, it, it's, it's so obvious to me that it was done this way that it's laughable, but it's not laughable because it, it, the tragedy is that maybe they're going to put a lot of people off from watching something that matters yeah, I... and that is far more important. You know, I mean, I, I, if a child was abused, that would be the most important thing in the world, I agree. And I would have walked off that set immediately and I would have done something. What I did do, they, they claim I did nothing. I did two things. I immediately spoke to the person concerned, looking after the boy, and reassured myself that she was looking out for his best interest. And I spoke with Dan Curtis that night and I insisted that I would not work with any more foreign children that I couldn't uh, speak the language of that they had to be English or American and they had to have a mother on the set and that's exactly what he did. He hired two American children to play the remaining role, the remaining character uh, episodes with, with this little boy. And in fact they reshot the film with another little boy and Entertainment Tonight has an interview with that little boy who did the reshoot. I appreciate your explanation. Thank You're you. Welcome. Okay. Uh, was there a time in your life where, or a landmark film where you actually took time and reflected and, and kind of patted yourself on the back, reflected and said, I've arrived, I, I've, I've made it, I'm successful? No. <laughs> no. I, I, you know, it, it shocks me because people say to me, say, you're successful. And, and I think, I don't... I don't feel successful, I don't feel any different. I just feel that at last I'm doing material that matters to me and that, that's, I believe, good material. Um, but I don't know anyone who is successful who ever believes they've arrived anywhere. I think the whole, the whole process of being an actor or an actress or being in the communications business, as it were, is to constantly communicate and to find new things to communicate. So. Um, no, I don't feel very successful at all. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Just slightly richer, I take it. Um, Sorry, I missed that. Uh, just slightly richer, I would take it. Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> very fortunate that way, yes. But I also am married to a man who uh, graduated from UCLA as a political science major and <laughs> 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 in 1971. And uh, something like cum laude or something or other, I don't know. He's trying to explain to me what that meant. It sounded like come louder or something to me. I didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we had a laugh about that. He tells me there are two grades above that, so he was like middle of the road. But, but he obviously learned something here that enabled him to make money, and we live happily. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you're a very fascinating woman, and I am just intrigued about your background. You have brothers and sisters, and uh, what was family like, um, like for you? I, I grew up in um, a, a not very nice or ordinary part of Wimbledon called Merton Park and then in a place called Hillingdon Middlesex which is near the airport. My father's an obstetrician and gynecologist and a great um, believer in, um, in sort of the left wing. Um, my uncle's a professor of sociology and you probably if you study sociology you read some of his books. His name is Professor Ronald Frankenberg and he writes... Um, apparently books that everyone has to read <laughs> on the subject. Um, I have two sisters. We were born about a year and four months apart. Their names are Sally and Anne. I'm the oldest. And um, we grew up in a sort of ordinary middle class um, suburb. My mother survived a Japanese concentration camp in Indonesia. She was in, interned for three and a half years during the war. And she's Dutch by nationality. And um, I went to um, regular schools and then to a ballet school from the time I was 13. And my parents were extraordinary in that, although we never had any money to speak of, there was always enough money for books or records or going to the theater, even though we always sat in the gods. We sat at the back. But um, that's how I grew up. I grew up going to opera, going to the ballet, going to the theater, and uh, traveling a great deal, um, uh, often sleeping in the back of the car. <laughs> 
but uh, we got around a lot and, and they really made life very special for us. That's great to have you here. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Jane. Uh, when you lost... <laughs> Long time no see. Uh, when you lost... Is there a light? When you lost dancing, uh, fortunately for all of us, you became an actress. Not that it will ever happen, hopefully, but if you lost acting, do you have other things that you would like to do? I would like to teach. I, I, have, I think that's the most honorable and most wonderful profession that exists. Uh, I think it's the most important. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't get to go to university. I snuck in, actually, to Sussex University, although they don't know it. I never took any exams because I never got in properly, but I, I used to go to the lectures. <laughs> When I, so I did go to university, but uh, they don't know it. Um, <laughs> but I have had the opportunity of working with my seven-year-old, who's in second grade in Santa Barbara, and they have a program where the mothers are allowed, or parents are allowed to come in and help teaching. And I really, I'm so satisfied by that. It's, it's one of the most thrilling experiences that I have, I have going for me, is teaching. And, and I really, I love helping kids, that particularly that, that have stumbling blocks and really aren't interested in learning. I like, the, I, I like the idea of teaching people, teaching kids to want to be interested in learning more for themselves. And so that's what I would have liked to have done. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi. Hi. I was wondering, you wear some really beautiful costumes in your, in your films and movies and things. What do you do with those costumes? Do you keep any of them? Um, I didn't used to be able to, and I certainly don't get to keep the ones that they rent or the ones that are originals or, you know, the ones that are made by a costume house and then rented to the movie. But I have recently, in, in um, my contract, had a stipulation that I get to keep the costumes that I want to keep, that are bought for me. So yes, I do have a, closets full of clothes. And uh, it's quite funny because um, the first time this happened, I did a, a comedy called Oh Heavenly Dog with Chevy Chase. And I remember looking at these clothes months afterwards and I thought, well, I'll put this jacket on today. And, put my hands in the pocket, and out came this meat that I used to feed Benji the dog with. <laughs> Dry cleaned, I will have you say, but, but it was meat, you know. I, so, um, but I do, I get to keep the clothes, and I often, um, I, I use them for charitable um, fundraising sometimes. I donate them, and people spend a lot of money buying them. So they do come in handy. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Since you work so much internationally, I was wondering if it's important for you to live in America or if you could live anywhere else at your own choice. I feel uh, that it has, I've been living in America for 13 years now. I would not have the career I have today, I don't believe, if I hadn't come to America. I think, I believe America is still the land of opportunity. I believe that um, it's the center of the movie industry because financially movies cost so much money to make. Um, this seems to be the center. And uh, happily now, my career is very international. The film I'm doing at the moment is a French film. Um, films I've done before that were, one was an Argentinian co-production, one a Malaysian co-production, one was a Spanish co-production, another one was an English co-production. So this really, I think, proves my point that that's why one has to be here. But I don't spend as much time in America as I'd like to, actually. They keep sending me abroad to make the movies. Thanks. Hello. With uh, this busy schedule that you have, how much time do you manage to spend with your children? I always take the summer off, and um, I have a lovely 15th century house in England, and a uh, bit of a farm, really. And um, I, I try to take those three months off to be with the kids. And I'm with the kids every opportunity I have. Um, I, take, I took the children with me on my last film because I'd been missing them so much before and uh, they ended up being cast in the movie. So now I have two movie stars, you know, a three-year-old and a seven-year-old. <laughs> and um, that was another very interesting experience. Um, it was a gamble. I spoke to the school teacher about taking them out of school and missing studies and how they felt about it. And in fact, the children had an even broader and, and according to the teachers, better education by coming with me because I took them to art galleries in Paris. They started to learn the language. They, they uh, understood about cultures and other cultures. They visited all the Versailles and they learned about history. And now they, they, you know, they have this appetite to learn. And um, they also got a, a lot of feeling of, um, 
I don't know, not self-importance is not the word, but they, they can hold themselves up straight and they're not scared anymore of making lots of friends rather than just clinging on to one. So I do, I spend a lot of time with my kids and I drag them around the world when I can. Thank you. Hi, your role of a solitaire in Live and Let Die, which is still my favorite role of yours. <laughs> um, <laughs> whenever, uh, you, at the time you were uh, 20 years old and you were an unknown, how is it you landed such a high profile in the prestigious part in James Bond? I'll tell you, they were time. looking for a virgin and they were thin on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's exactly it. You know, I, I was a, an actress. I was doing a, a series at the time called The Oneidian Line, and I was wearing dresses, Victorian dresses, from here to the ground. So, I mean, I was really not the kind of person you'd be thinking of for a James Bond film. And, and they asked to meet me, and they met me, and they'd seen me on television, and they offered me the part on the spot. And it, it just doesn't happen like that normally. And, in fact, they had to uh, sort of wangle things with the BBC to get me out of the other series because I was still working on it. And I was astounded. I was more surprised than anyone else that they hired me, and I still am surprised. <laughs> but um, they were looking for a very innocent young girl, and as I said, they were thin on the ground that year. <laughs> How was working with uh, Roger Moore? A wonderful experience. He was really marvelous, and uh, he has a great sense of humor. He, he taught me a, a lot of things very early on, which is that if you can't laugh at yourself first, you know, you're damned. <laughs> and, um, you know, you, you really always have to have a sense of humor about all this, because it is work. Thank you. And that's what it is. <clears throat> You're welcome. Um, I was just curious, as you do so much work internationally, what other languages do you speak? I speak French, uh, according to the French fluently, according to uh, the, uh, when I graduated from high school, I failed. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but they, I'm now making French movies, so I suppose I speak French. And I speak a little Dutch because of my mother. My father and mother used to speak Dutch when they didn't want the kids to understand. And I've discovered that I have an ear, which is just a gift, for uh, accents and for languages. And um, I had to speak Cantonese in my last movie, uh, which was very hard. I have to say, Cantonese, that's, that's tough. There's like five ways of saying, oh, and it means, <laughs> it means five completely different things, and you really don't want to get it wrong. <laughs> but I mean, I have, you know, a smattering of, of uh, a little Hungarian, and uh, I, I, love, I love languages. I think if I had time, I would learn more languages. Thank you. Yes. Hi, um, I've, been asked, I've been waiting to ask you this question, and I've been afraid that I'll, I'll be wrong. But um, I saw a movie on television a few years ago, which you played identical twins. Yes. Oh, good. Yes. And I remember, <laughs> I forgot, um, but I remembered that um, there was one scene where, I've seen a lot of movies where people play, play twins. Right. The same person plays two people. I remembered one scene, you were sitting next to your sister, or yourself, and then you yes. put... You leaned over and you put your head on her lap, and I was wondering how that was done and how it felt like playing two people. Those were the those were the uh, two or no, I don't know how many seconds it lasted. About ten seconds, the most expensive ten seconds in that film. <laughs> it's a, a system called rotoscope, and I think uh, I'm, I'm not very good at all that stuff. But they showed me how it was done. It was fantastic. I got my sister in to be my body double, so she was like. Uh, when they wanted the back of my neck or another body that I actually lay my head on, that was actually my sister, um, although she doesn't really resemble me that much. Um, what they did is they, they, had, they would shoot the whole scene with me as one twin, say the sitting upright one talking, um, and they would have another actress um, dressed in the costume, or, or, or my sister, if it was a double, doing the other action. And then we would, I'd rush out, change, and be, and be the other twin, and the other person would change into the, my other costume and sit there. And they rotoscoped it out. They, they, it's, um, I think it's a computer that, that just um, takes out you know, the, the, the framing of the face and then puts my face into that face. <laughs> I mean, you're still in the dark about this. So am I. But <laughs> That's what they said they did, and, and I must admit, I was fooled, too. <laughs> Hi. Any more? We have time for just uh, two more questions. I don't think we have any. Oh, yes. Oh. I'm curious. Um, you have know, a really wide variety of roles, and you really do get into your roles, and I really think that's great. I was wondering how, how well do you take these things home with you? Well, I, it's true. I do take, I take the roles home with me. I, I, I try not to. I... I only know one way of, of acting, really. I don't have a method or anything like that. Uh, 
I just become that person as best I can. And sometimes if you're playing someone very evil, like Kathy in East of Eden, it, it's, um, I hit a major depression after it. For weeks after that, I was just plain depressed. And um, I almost sort of felt I had arthritis, and I almost felt I was schizophrenic. You know, I, I just... So the character got inside of me very deeply. And I must admit, playing Natalie, um, it's now three years ago, but I still find it hard to watch or to talk about some of the sequences because I have never really got Natalie out of my system. Um, Kathy, I'm glad to say, went. <laughs> She's gone. Natalie, I hope a little of Natalie stays with me forever. But it's, it's very hard because uh, when you go home to your family and you were to cook dinner and and uh, talk to your kids about what they're doing at school and whether or not they're going to join brownies and what, what happened at soccer practice. It's, you, you have to just cut off. And I just I try as best I can. But I, I think one of the, the beauties of the work I've been doing recently is that I was on location. I was away from my family. And I was able to absolutely tunnel into and think of nothing but the work while I was there. And then it was just phone calls. But it, it's very hard to do. It's very hard to turn it com off completely. Hi. Uh, my question isn't real specific. I just thought if I didn't get up here and ask something, I'd feel like a fool. So, uh, <laughs> on some, I noticed the movie Somewhere in Time is my most favorite movie. And uh, Yay. <laughs> when, it, when it came out... <laughs> 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 